Let us bow heads in prayer. Father heaven, as we begin to search the word of God, reveal to us the truth regarding the Sabbath, how important it is to you, and for those who trust you, it should be important, equally as important. Give us the truth, that we may learn the truth, and it's only the truth regarding the Sabbath that we should follow, not the truth as men think so, but the truth as it is in Jesus, who called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We will continue our study here on the Sabbath, and we will reply to a uh, question asked, or maybe it was really a declaration. It was not just an interrogative. It was a, a declaration where a man said that, uh, well, the Sabbath, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, therefore, if I accept him as my Lord and Savior, he is my Sabbath. Does that make any sense? Well, first of all, the Sabbath is a day. It isn't a person. The Lord of the Sabbath is not the Sabbath. Evidently, because he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is a word that we find right from the beginning at creation where the day was declared, the seventh day or the end of the creation week was declared by the creator himself as the Sabbath day, the very first proper name given to any of the seven days of the septenary week. So the Sabbath day is a day of 24 hours, as we seen in our previous studies, uh, where it is an evening and a morning were the first day, and evening and morning were the second day. We will go through this because... Three of our Christian brethren are saying that it is my Sabbath. Somebody says, well, it's, uh, it's the Christian Sabbath, but it's the first day of the week. Some say, well, take any day of the week. One out of the seven is fine. Or it's tantamount to saying that uh, your Sabbath versus the Lord's Sabbath. So we will ask the, the scriptures as we go through this to understand how God wants us to take control of the way we understand the Sabbath by allowing the Word of God to control ourselves. So we will ask the Lord of the Sabbath as he spoke to the prophet Ezekiel. All right, the prophet Ezekiel on the difference between the Lord's Sabbath when he says my Sabbath versus your Sabbath. So let's turn our Bibles to Exodus chapter 31, 13. We'll begin there and then transfer into the book of Ezekiel. In Exodus 31, 13, I'm going to begin to read, um, or rather, 13, yes. Speak unto, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that sanctify you. Right off the bat, we see here that the word Sabbath is connected with sanctification. And then in verse 14, we read, You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you, and everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Verse 15 says, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in, in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Verse 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And in verse 18, 
And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now, let's turn now to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22. This is quite an amount of reading that we will do, but it makes, it is valuable. Because you see, the preponderance of the scriptures itself will attest to the importance of knowing what Sabbath is, who the Lord of the Sabbath is, and which day is the Sabbath. In Exodus, Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 1 and it came to pass in the seventh year in the fifth month the tenth day of the month that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and to set before me that is to the prophet Ezekiel then came the word of the Lord unto me saying in verse 3 son of man speak unto the elders of Israel and say unto them thus saith the Lord God. Are you come to inquire of me? Will not be inquired it will I not be inquired of you? So son of man, speak to them. As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Wilt thou judge them, son of man? Wilt thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. Now these are words of reproof but they are also words of love and counsel. Verse 5 says, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt. So you know what he's referring to. The time in which they were captives and slaves in Egypt before they were released through the uh, emancipation and then the book of Exodus, it says, I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God, in the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had spied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. It's the promised land. Verse 7 says, Then said I unto them, Can you... Cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes, and defile not your, yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Verse 8, But they rebelled against me. They would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abomination of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. And in verse 9 it says, But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. Verse 10, Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. Now we're moving forward here. And I gave them statutes and showed them my judgment, if, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Now look at verse 12, chapter 20, Ezekiel. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord, the God that do sanctify them. You hear that again. Verse 13, But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes. They despised my judgment, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths, my Sabbath, he says, they greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Can you see now? The Sabbath was already an issue just during the trial, that 40 year uh, traversing the journey from Egypt into the promised land. It was already an issue. 
Verse 14, but I wrote for my name's sake that it should be not be a polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. That was the pollution issue here on the Sabbath. Verse 15, yet also I lifted up mine hand unto them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Why? Verse 16, because they despised my judgments. They walked not in the statutes that I gave down to them, but they polluted my Sabbaths. They polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, mine eyes spared them from destroying them, neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. The Lord's mercy endured forever. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. Verse 19, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. Once more in verse 20, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Can anything be clearer than that? On the Lord's Sabbath, it is a sign of sanctification. It is a sign that he is the God. It is a sign of the relationship between God and his people. Verse 21, notwithstanding the children, they rebelled against me. They walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgment to them to do them. If a man do, he shall even live in them. Once more, they polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. And finally, in verse 24, you can read the whole chapter. Because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. So they did not learn the lesson from the experience of their elders. They repeated them instead of overcoming them and putting an end to it and say, this is where the box stops. They continued it and it worsened the issue. So we're going to read what God says furthermore regarding the Sabbath uh, from the Bible. In other words, the Sabbath is a, it's called not a Sabbath or one Sabbath out of other, but the Sabbath, a limiting article there, meaning to say the Sabbath. The latter is a limiting article. It is a day of 24 hours, even as the first day of the week, called, later called Sunday in honor of the sun, not by God, but by the sun worshipers. It's a 24-hour day. And so, um, there has to be only one Sabbath, not many Sabbaths. Only one Sabbath since there is only one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all, and all in you all, Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. That shows you very clearly that there's only one Sabbath because there's only one Lord, one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so here I will present a few facts, biblical facts about the biblical Sabbath. And I pray that you and I will consider them carefully and take your own Bible and prayerfully examine the text of scriptures that I'll be sharing with you without any preconceived ideas and opinions. Allow the infallible word, the preponderance of scriptural evidence to speak to you by the work of the Holy Spirit. Number one, we went through this earlier. God made the Sabbath at creation. Not when he gave the Ten Commandments, but at creation. Genesis chapter 2, 2, 3, and compare that with Exodus 20, verse 11. We covered that much earlier. Number two, it was observed even before that law, the law of Ten Commandments was given at Mount Sinai. 
Exodus chapter 16, 23 to 30. The command, number three, the command to observe it is associated with nine moral precepts which are binding upon all man during all time. And this is wonderful. If you look at it, the number of words before and after, it was placed right at the bosom of the Ten Commandments, right at the center. Uh, Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17, and Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 22. As somebody pointed this out using the old um, version, there were equally an amount of letters and words, written letters, before and after the Fourth Commandment, meaning to say that before you can break this, really to protect it, you had to climb all over the other commandments before you could break the fourth commandment. It was protected thereby. Number four, divine wrath came upon ancient Israel for breaking the Sabbath. Now, this is very sobering, friends. Okay, um, Let's go back to the book of Nehemiah. Now, uh, during the rebuilding of the walls of Israel, God had used three men, namely um, Zerubbabel, um, they have Nehemiah, Israel the scribe, and Nehemiah was actually the last of them. He was the cupbearer, and God moved upon the hearts of three Persian kings, namely, um, remember this, Darius, which was the last of them. Cyrus was the first, followed by... Um, Darius and then Artaxerxes. They all assisted in rebuilding the desolated walls of Jerusalem. And we asked the question, why was it desolated? Let's ask Nehemiah. Uh, well, let's read from Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 to 18. In those days saw I Judah, some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. Verse 16 says, There dwelt men in Tyre also therein which brought fish, and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Verse 17 says, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Verse 18, Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? That's Jerusalem. Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Read that for yourself, Nehemiah 13, 15 to 18. Now, the prophet, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 19 to 27, he attests and witnessed to this fact. It's a sobering fact. If the Sabbath had been kept faithfully in Jerusalem, it would not have been destroyed. Now let's read through it. Jeremiah 17, 19 to 27. Verse 19 says, Thus saith the Lord God unto me, that's to Jeremiah, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. Verse 20, And say unto them, Hear ye the words of the Lord, ye kings of Judah. And all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. Verse 21, thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Not bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Verse 22, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do ye any work but hallow or make holy the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. Now, verse 23, But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ears, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. In verse 24, And it shall come to pass, look at this condition now, 
It shall come to pass, if you diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein, verse 25, then were, then were entered into the gates of the city's kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and horses. They and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the city shall remain forever. You would wish that you would read only thus far, but read a little further. In verse 26, They shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the plains and from the mountains, and from the south, bringing burnt offerings and incense and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the Lord, to the house of the Lord. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. Then shall I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Do you see that, friends? You know, number six, prophecy foretells and enjoins a reform on the Sabbath. I love the book of Isaiah. It was a gospel prophet. In Isaiah 58, verses 12 to 14, we read verse 12, And they shall be of thee, sh and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the bridge, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, not a burden, a holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing their own ways, your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words. That's on the Sabbath day. Here's the promise. Then sh thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Again, the Sabbath will be will exist in the new earth. Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. Verse 22 says, For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I will make or create, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Verse 23, And it shall come to pass. That from one new moon to another, that's monthly. And from one Sabbath to another, that's weekly. Shall all flesh, that is the glorified flesh already, come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Now, this is the new heaven. The same new heavens and new earth shown to John. In the book of Revelation, we read that in Revelation 21 verse 1. John says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. You can read the rest of the chapter. Number eight, Christ himself, the Lord of the Sabbath, observed and kept the Sabbath. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Verse 20 says, And straightway he called them, that is James and his brother John, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship or the boat with their hired servants. And they went after him, after Christ. Verse 21 says, And they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day, what did he do? He entered into the synagogue and taught. Verse 22, And they were astonished at his doctrine or teaching for he had taught them as one that had authority and not like the scribes. That was a super distinction between the power of his teaching because he was teaching on the Sabbath day and the Lord of the Sabbath was declaring the truths of the Sabbath on the day that he chose. Verse 9, or rather number 9, Jesus called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. All right. Mark 2, 27 and 28. And he said unto them, you read verses 23 to 26, the Sabbath was made for men and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. 
Number 10, it was his custom or habit or practice for him to preach on the Sabbath day. Let's look at Luke chapter 4, 15 and 16. And we read, And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Look at verse 14. He was glorified because of the power of his preaching. In verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, sort of a homecoming. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. You can read the rest of the chapter. Number 11, the disciples themselves, they rested on the Sabbath while Christ was lying in the grave. Luke 23, verses 52 to 56. This man, that's Joseph of Arimathea. You read in the verses prior to that. He went into Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Verse 53 says, And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone wherein men never had been laid. Verse 54 says, And that day was the preparation, or the Friday, or preparation day. And the Sabbath drew on. You see that? Verse 55, And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after. And they beheld the sepulcher. And how his body was laid. But in verse 56, what did they do? And they returned. And they prepared spices and ointments. And rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now remember, this is Christ. A lot of Sabbath lying in the grave. While his disciples, the women too, were resting according to the commandment. Now, number 12. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who wrote after the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, they wrote and spoke familiarly of the Sabbath as an existing institution. Mark 24, 20 says, But pray ye, remember Matthew, Matthew 24, 20. You can read that chapter there in verses 15 to 19 about the abomination of desolation. And then he adds, but pray ye that your flight be not in winter. So there's this season there. Neither on the Sabbath day, speaking of the day itself. And then in Matthew 28, 1, it says in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, dawn towards the first day of the week, can anything be clear in that? Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Matthew 28, 1. See, the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. Let's see what it says in Mark 16, verses 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him or the body of Jesus. And then very early, it tells you exactly when, and very early in the morning of the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Number 13, let's go to Paul's example. It was his custom to reason from the scriptures with the believers on the Sabbath day. And he wrote, that's, uh, his partner wrote this, that these this writings of written, the acts of, of the apostles were written, of course, after Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. What do we read in verse 1? Acts chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And verse 2 says, And Paul, in as his manner was, or as his custom was, he went into them, and three Sabbath days, that means three weeks, he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. You read that for yourself in Acts chapter 17, 1 and 2. And then in the same book, Acts 13, 42 to 44, even the Gentile believers. And it says almost the whole city 
observe the Sabbath. Let's read that. Acts chapter 13, beginning verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. In verse 43 it says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And then verse 44, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Now, do you see how much proof we have from the word of God itself? There's more. Number 15, Paul preached by a riverside where there was no synagogue on the Sabbath day. Acts chapter 16, 12 and 13. Verse 12 says, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. Verse 13, And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer or worship was wont to be made, and we sat down there and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So they kept the Sabbath by a riverside, not merely in the synagogue. It was the day that made a difference. Number 16, Paul reasoned at the synagogue in Corinth every Sabbath. Acts 18, 1 and 4. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and abode with Aquila and Priscilla, his fellow believers and fellow tent makers. Verse 4, it says, And he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Furthermore, Paul continued there in Acts 18.11. It says, Paul continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God. Now, when you count that, a year and six months, that's at least 78 Sabbaths. Finally, in the last mention of it in the Bible, it is called the Lord's Day. Revelation 1 verse 10. So you can compare all of this to what we just read. The, the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. Jesus is not the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. And the apostles, the disciples, the followers, and even the Jews and the Gentiles all kept the Sabbath. Now, what about the facts about the first day of the week, Sunday? We will put them in contrast. Because by doing so, we will see the stark difference as based on the scriptures. The first verses we read makes it very abundantly clear that that was the seventh day of the week. And that the next day is the first day of the week. Number one, facts about the first day of the week or Sunday. Number one, Christ rose from the dead on that day. Mark 16 verse 9, Matthew 28 verse 1, Mark 16 2, John 20 verse 1. But Jesus never said before his crucifixion or after his resurrection to any or all of his disciples publicly or privately, neither even remotely suggested by way of parable, especially not by way of prophecy, that his prophesied resurrection day, it was prophesied, would therefore and from there on become the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord. Never. You will never find that. Number two, the women brought spices to the grave of the Savior on that day. That's the first day of the week. Luke 24, verse 1, which they would not do on the Sabbath. Look at Luke 23, verse 56. Number three, Christ appeared to his disciples in the evening of the first day. That is the time between noon and sunset according to the Jewish calendar. We read there in John 20 and 19, the doors of the room or house they were in was recorded as being shut. And some people say there's the evidence that they met on the first day of the week. But if you read through it, John 20 verse 19, they says it was shut for fear of the Jews. So they were not assembled to keep the Sabbath and do worship services, but they had closed the doors for fear 
over their personal safety. The Jews, particularly the religious leaders, were now hunting them down uh -huh, as criminals because the first persecutors of the first Christians were not the Romans, but their own fellow Jews, their own people. Even as Christ himself was persecuted by his own people, was rejected. As Jesus warned his disciples before his passion, what did he say? John 15, 20, the servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me. They will persecute you also. And it was thus so that John wrote after Christ's ascension in his epistle regarding Christ. You know this by heart. Many of you, he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1 verses 11 and 12. Number four, Paul once preached on the evening of the first day, Acts 20 verse 7, corresponding with our Saturday night. But the next morning, which answers with our Sunday morning, he continued his journey towards Jerusalem. Well, here we know that there are so many things that we don't understand about why people keep a day outside of the Sabbath that Jesus had himself kept, himself the creator set apart. We will ask this, we will make sure that we we, we go through the verses of the scriptures to compare uh, what it says about the seventh day and the first day of the week. Now, let me summarize this very quickly. Number one, there is no divine command for Sunday observance. Number two, there is not the least hint of a Sunday institution in the Bible. Number three, Christ never changed God's Sabbath to Sunday. Number four, he never observed Sunday as the Sabbath. Number five, his apostles never kept Sunday for a Sabbath. Number six, there is no prophecy that Sunday would ever take the place of the seventh-day Sabbath. But it is prophesied that the man of sin will seek to change times and laws and attempt to transfer the sanctity of the Sabbath to Sunday. It is a direct challenge to God's authority as the creator and redeemer. And thus, this is the prophesied act of great apostasy. Number seven, the word Sunday never occurs in the Bible. Number eight, neither God, nor Christ, nor any of the angels, nor any of the inspired writers of the Holy Scriptures have ever said one word in favor of transferring the sanctity of the Sabbath to Sunday. Now, these are very fundamental facts in regard to the Sabbath and to the first day of the week. And it's my prayer that you will search the Bible for yourselves, plead for the Holy Spirit of truth to convince, to convict, to teach, to guide, direct, and to bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever you read, whatsoever is taught in the New Testament, that nothing which the written word says regarding the matter may be carelessly or inadvertently left out, forgotten, and misunderstood or misapplied while doing your due diligence in the commended Berean spirit and effort. Acts 17, 11, they say they chose they, to see whether those things were so. They are willing to listen, but they went back, went home, and studied the scriptures and verified all of them. It is my desire, God's desire, that you and I will understand fully, without any doubt, as to which the Sabbath day is, and make the decision to remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. May God bless you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that the Bible spoke to us today. May we hear the Master's voice speaking to us. May we hear the voice of the shepherd calling to his sheep to follow you, the lambs and the sheep 
know the shepherd's voice. We pray that we shall be numbered among them, and that we shall be not only numbered, we shall be set apart and sanctified by the Sabbath, even now. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.